Welcome to CS 159. Uh, today, we are really delighted to have a guest lecturer, Brandon Amos from Facebook AI Research. Uh, Brandon is a research scientist there for his thesis work, uh, which he did at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he worked on differential optimization, which will be the topic of today's lecture. Brandon, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Um, I guess if, yeah, if you have any questions or if you want to uh, go on any tangents during this lecture, um, but let me know. Um, so the, the, the kind of the, the content of this talk is focused around modeling and machine learning. And the, the big question that I think a lot of people in the community are, are asking is, can we throw big neural networks at every problem? And can we continue doing this to get good results? And it's not clear if we can or not. Um, because on one hand, neural networks and, and like big models are providing a lot of really compelling empirical successes in a lot of fields from vision, reinforcement learning, and, and language. Um, and so maybe if we are able to just continue scaling up the data collection process, and if we're able to continue scaling up like the compute capacities that we have for training such models, maybe, maybe the, so the solution to something that looks like artificial general intelligence is to throw a big neural network at a lot of data. Um, but when some of these settings don't hold, for example, when you, when you don't have a lot of data or when maybe you don't have a lot of compute or maybe when you want to kind of interpret what's going on better inside of, the, inside of the model, I think it's worth thinking about how you can start adding some amount of structure to your model that captures the, um, kind of like the, the domain knowledge that you have about the problem that you are modeling. And I think that this can often be done in, in nice ways that captures some, some lat latent structure that you have in your problem, such that you can still have learnable neural networks and, and learnable modules flying around in, in so, like some parts of your model, but you can still have specialized components that maybe at the end of your model that can, um, can add structure that is interpretable in, in some way. And there's been a lot of work in the community on adding these kinds of structured oper operations. Um, it seems like perhaps one, one recipe to getting a, this kind of, of paper accepted at one of the conferences is to take a, a classical algorithm and to say, here's how we can make it differentiable, or here's how we can make it differentiable with, with non-zero derivatives. And to then show how that's kind of useful in the machine learning context. And this can be done with a lot of techniques. And in this talk, I'll, I'll kind of I'll be talking about how we can do this with um, optimization, and I claim that it's it's useful to think about optimization as being a uh, kind of a, a building block or, or components that you can use inside of your uh, model, and this is kind of different than the way that we traditionally think about optimization in machine learning, whereas. Uh, you might typically think about optimization as um, something that you use to uh, find the best set of parameters of your model to optimize your, your loss function. And we can still do that, um, but that's, that's not what I'm uh, going to be talking about in, in this talk. I'm suggesting that we use optimization as a, a layer um, inside of the model as a way of adding domain knowledge um, that can capture hard constraints and in a way that can integrate and train nicely with the other components that you have in your end-to-end -end learning system. And in this talk, I'll, I'll show how that uh, these layers have a lot of applications in reinforcement learning, control, meta-learning, game theory, and optimal transport. And one, one way of kind of, uh, like one demonstration I, I have of these is Suppose that you, you have some modeling problem where you, you know you, you have some set of true latent hard constraints, which I'm showing in, in blue here. And you want a way of modeling those um, in, in a hard way. Um, I, I claim that optimization is a nice way of, of adding this structure to your model so that your model understands the concepts of, of say polytopes or of, of ellipses or other kinds of nice convex sets that you can uh, maybe project onto, or maybe have other operations on top of that's happening in the latent space of, of your model. 
And what this animation is showing in the, uh, the, the red polytopes that are being fit to the blue ones, this is showing how you can learn these polytopes or, or ellipses uh, from, from data. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details behind this uh, later in the talk, but I'm just uh, putting it here to, uh, to, prime, to prime the idea that you can have some idea or some concept of hard constraints inside of your model. Um, so the, the big picture of this uh, talk is that we will start with, uh, with a warm-up and uh, we will talk about how you can um, actually interpret a lot of the standard layers as themselves solving optimization problems. Um, this is useful to get a grounding of how to use optimization-based modeling because we're already using it anyway, um, just implicitly. Um, next, I'll talk about uh, the, the theory and practice of, of differential optimization and, and what it really means to um, kind of like set up these problems and, and how you can practically use them. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll go into uh, one of the application areas that I've uh, been focusing on in the uh, control and reinforcement learning side, um, where you can have differentiable controllers. Uh, so starting off, let's, um, again, as, as a warm-up, um, I'm going to present ways of interpreting standard operations as optimization-based modeling components. And I'm not claiming that, that we should ever do this, like practically, because it, it can be rather intractable to, uh, to solve an optimization problem instead of solving the, like, the normal ReLU operation. Um, but I think it's an interesting perspective because it enables us to um, kind of start thinking about how we can model with optimization and how we can extend this to uh, settings that aren't as simple. Um, so here's, here's the ReLU. And I claim that you can represent the ReLU with the optimization problem that, that I, I have on the screen. And the way you can interpret this optimization problem is that it's doing a projection onto the non-negative orthant. And you can, you can kind of visualize this with the figure I have on, on the right, where um, uh, if, you, if you look at this cost surface and, and take the minimum of it, um, in the, the non-negative orthant, you get the, the ReLU function. And this is kind of, in, this is interesting now, because we, we now have a convex function that represents the ReLU. And and if to prime this idea, we also care about differentiating through this convex optimization problem with respect to the, the inputs, so to, with respect to x. Um, but x is now hidden inside of this argument operation. And it's not clear in the general case how you can differentiate the, uh, the optimal y with respect to x. Um, however, in, if you just write out the, the solution, the explicit closed form solution, it's really easy to differentiate or, or sub-differentiate y with respect to x because we can just use automatic, automatic differentiation. Um, but in the second part, we can't just use automatic differentiation. And if, if you're familiar with it, we, we also can't unroll optimizers over, over this optimization problem or, or over optimization problems easily in this context because we might have some set of really non-trivial constraints on the problem. So that's kind of where this is going. Um, any, any questions on the, the basic setup before I move on to a few other, other examples? Right, so um, the sigmoid, it's also a convex optimization layer. And the way that you can see this is that it's, it's also doing a projection onto the um, zero one box in this case. Uh, where this, uh, this H term is, the, is a bidirectional entropy term. And again, you, you can you kind of just like, you can look at the, um, the, the contour surface of, of this optimization problem, and you can convince yourself that the solution is the uh, sigmoid. And, and if you look at the first order optimality conditions of this optimization problem, you, you also get the, the sigmoid out of it. And uh, lastly, you can also interpret the softmax as a convex optimization layer. And the way that you can see this is that 
it's it's very similar to the sigmoid, except you also are you're projecting onto the simplex, um, where where you also have an entropy penalty over over the cost surface. Um, so if you take the first order optimality condition of this, then you get the normal closed form solution that we have to the softmax. Um, and so, so now that I've shown that we are all already using convex optimization layers for our you know, like more standard rudimentary layers, I'll next talk about how we can generalize this idea of having convex optimization layers in, in a more general setting where we're now optimizing over general parameterized convex functions uh, subject to uh, general convex constraints. Um, and we're, we're returning the argument, uh, which for most, for, for most of this talk, for, for most of my work, I assume the argument is, is uh, unique. Um, and uh, we will talk about how we can uh, so I'll use this for modeling and differentiate through uh, the output of this with respect to the uh, parameters that are inside of the uh, constraints and the objectives. And so you can interpret this as a building block that has a, a learnable objective function and uh, constraint surface. Um, so, right, the, the, this next part of the talk is on uh, differential optimization theory and practice. Any questions or comments before I move on to that? Great. So uh, I think the most foundational component of, of understanding how to differentiate through optimization problems is the implicit function function theorem that um, is You've probably seen in some of your calculus classes. I think it's a very practical tool in um, a lot of the um, kind of more interesting models for, for machine learning that involve having some kind of implicit function rather than a, an explicit function, like optimization problems. And um, if you think about the like the sigmoid example for this, it, it might help with some of your intuition. Um, but the implicit function theorem says that. We're, we're given some set of, or we're given some implicitly defined function um, by finding the uh, zero points of, of G or of some other function. And the implicit function theorem is how do we differentiate this, uh, this implicit function F um, by looking at both of the components. And so it, it says, all you need to do is find the solution to this uh, this zero um, finding problem to this root finding problem, um, and then look at the two uh, derivatives along the um, of like both of the components that you have. And um, once you do that, combine them in, in this way, and you'll get out the derivative to the implicit function um, only by differentiating the uh, like this g function that you you have access to. Um, and so on the um, sigmoid example, um, it's now a zero finding problem rather than an optimization problem, but we can still kind of use the same intuition or we can still use the same kind of visualization where now if, if you look at the derivative with respect to the y components um, of, of this problem, um, depending on how you formulate G, so, so there's not necessarily a unique formulation for, for G for the, um, for the sigmoid. Um, but you usually get out the identity matrix here for, for the, uh, the y derivative. Um, and then over the x derivative, you'll just get out the derivative of the sigmoid function. And so the implicit function theorem for, for this example would just would give the usual derivative of the sigmoid function that, that we would expect. Um, and this, this all requires uh, mild assumptions on, on the functions that you're differentiating to hold, which usually hold in practice. And um, now that we have this building block of having an implicit function, we can now apply this to differentiating through optimization layers, um, where we can start in the simplest case of differentiating through a quadratic program, uh, which is what we did in OpsNet. And um, oh, it's, it's also a convex quadratic program. 
Um, so I, I assume you're familiar with the uh, convex quadratic form, uh, which I, I have at the top here, um, which says minimize this uh, quadratic objective subject to a, a linear equality constraint and um, uh, this polytope. And once you do that, you're interested in differentiating the, um, the output x star here uh, with respect to the parameters or with respect to the, um, the, the, the data matrices of, of this optimization problem. And the way that you, you apply the implicit function theorem to this is that you find this uh, zero finding problem. And the zero finding problem comes from uh, KKT optimality um, from the convex optimization theory. The, the details of this aren't necessarily important for, for this talk, so I, I'm absorbing them into this, uh, this R function now. And the thing to understand here is that we can transform this optimization problem into a root finding problem of, this, uh, of the KKT uh, residuals. And uh, where the KKT residuals is, is over a, sl a slightly larger variable, the Z, that contains the, like the primal X star and also dual variables and, and maybe slacks depending on how you actually do this transformation. Um, but the details aren't necessarily that important, but the, the big idea is just that you're able to convert this optimization problem into a uh, root finding problem. And next, once you have this root finding problem and, and you know that, that you have an optimal solution to the convex problem, you can then implicitly differentiate that, which in a few, uh, in, in, in one line tells you the derivative of the output of this optimization problem with respect to the parameters. And I think this is, um, I, I think this is uh, in, interesting. And, and that if you, if you look at the OptNet paper, the progression doesn't go this, um, this smoothly from the, from the KKT optimality to the implicit differentiation. Because one tricky part that comes up is that the theta here is actually has matrix values, uh, like Q, for example, or A and G. And so we ended up using matrix differential calculus to compute some of these these terms, and in doing so, we forgot to for, forgot to we forgot to start with just this simple progression of what we were actually trying to do. Um, so that's ho hopefully this this makes the um, derivation that that we ended up showing a bit clearer. Um, so next. I'll say on the theory side, and we, we're going to move to a more general class of convex optimization problems, just to show kind of how this can be done in, in, in an even more general setting that goes beyond uh, quadratics. Uh, because one, one issue is that there are a lot of convex problems that you can represent, that you, that you have that aren't quadratics, um, or maybe that don't have simple constraints like this problem does. And so it's, it's I think it's worth talking about the slightly more general theory of differentiating through convex problems. And I think a promising way of doing this is to think about differentiating through conic programs or convex conic programs, where you have a general form that looks almost like the quadratic form, um, except now you, you're thinking about a convex optimization problem that has a linear objective and constraints that lie with in a convex cone and i'm not i'm not sure how familiar you are you all are with convex cones or what you can represent or can't represent with them um so here are a few of examples of some of the common cones um so for example the the zero and free cone and non-negative cone can be used to represent uh, you know, like the standard constraints that you would have in, in convex optimization um, or that you would you would like be able to manually put down, um, and then there are some more general ones on on the second order cone, semi-definite cone, where you can search over some space of semi-definite matrices, um, or the exponential cone, 
so that you can have a convex constraint set that has exponential terms in it. Um, and you can also take uh, Cartesian products if cones. And the really powerful thing about this representation is that uh, CVXPy and other tools provide an automatic way of transforming almost any convex optimization problem into this conic form. And so if you're able to improve upon either a solver or if you're able to understand differentiation better on conic programs, then you're able to impact this huge class of convex problems that can all be transformed into conic programs with a rel relatively simple way. Um, and um, to make this connection even stronger is that you can transform a quadratic program with, say, a quadratic term in the objective into a cone program of this form with just a linear objective by moving the quadratic parts down into the um, into a second order cone. Um, and the, I guess the, the next question, once you have this more general conic form, is how do you differentiate through it? And you essentially apply the same trick where you transform this conic optimization problem into a root finding problem over, over an unconstrained space here. And when you, once you have this root finding problem, you just implicitly differentiate that. And the interesting thing to note here is that you can't get this straight in a straightforward way just from the KKT optimality. You need to use a more general set of optimality conditions that captures uh, some of the non-trivial cone constraints. Uh, for example, it's uh, some of these um, some of these cones that can't be represented in, in a nice way, like the um, like the exponential cone or the second order cone. Um, special care needs to be taken when thinking about the optimality conditions or thinking about implicitly differentiating some optimality conditions for the uh, for general kind of pro, uh, programs. But there exists a, a nice way to do this, and uh, once you once you have this, then you can implicitly differentiate the um, this, this, uh, these conditions. And kind of one, one, last, one last detail on the more theoretical side or kind of like more on the foundation side is what do you do if, if we want to have a similar setup where we want to have a model that has optimization components that are non-convex? And this becomes much trickier because we're not able to as easily pull out a, a nice set of optimality conditions like the KKT system or, or like this, the, the extension to the conic optimality. And this doesn't mean we're totally lost, but it means that we don't have as nice of a, of a theory to, to back up different, the differentiation approaches. And some of them might be significantly more computationally intractable. So, a few of the ways I've been thinking about this is, um, firstly, if, if you are able to hit a fixed point in some way on your non-convex problem, you can then do fixed point differentiation on, uh, on, on that fixed point, um, which you can kind of interpret as forming a locally convex approximation to this larger non-convex problem. If you're able to do that consistently, I, I think this is a good approach. Um, if you're not able to hit that fixed point consistently, I think unrolling some other optimizer, like, like kind of how like how MAML does, I think that's a really reasonable thing to do. Um, especially if you don't have that many constraints, um, unrolling through the gradient steps, or even doing some kind of uh, truncated unrolling of your gradient steps um, can get you a, a nice approximation to the optimization problem. And in many cases, or in, in some cases, if you are able to find the solution, unrolling through your gradient steps provably approximates the true derivative through the optimization problem. Um, third, you can unroll through some other kind of optimizer that, that you have. So maybe you don't have derivative information of, of the function, or maybe you maybe you were running a gradient descent on your function can hit some, some bad optimum. Um, so the third thing you can do is kind of think about other optimizers that you can, can differentiate through. A quick question. Yes. Um, so uh, another common strategy that people do is like sequential relaxations or sequential tightening. Uh, where you where you just approximate the non-convex problem by, by a sequence of convex problems. Now that, although very popular, doesn't strike me as something you could put into a, as a layer. I don't know if you've thought about that. 
Um, are you talking about problems that have like in integral constraints that you're relaxing? Yeah, for or? example, for example, a, a common approach in um, in graphical model inference is like iterative tightening of a, of, a, of the polytope, for example. Uh, yeah. So this is, I think this is tricky because if your true problem has discrete or combinatorial components, then I think even if you have a perfect solution to that, I think it's ill-defined what you actually mean by a gradient through that problem because your, your domain is, is kind of like this combinatorial or discrete space that doesn't necessarily have like the notion of a, of a derivative. I see. I see. So for the I see. So for the the Satnet follow up paper that uh, Zico's group worked on, they did an SDP relaxation of of Sat, and then they just stuck with the SDP relaxation. Is that is yes. that my understanding correct? Yes. So yes. So in that in that case, I think they're relying on the fact that the relaxate that if you continue if you take the continuous relaxation of in that case the max Sat problem. Then they are able, then then they can differentiate that relaxation, and this relaxed space has like some well defined or some kind of reasonable definition of of what it, the derivative actually is. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. For general combinatorial or discrete problems, I think this there's no reason why such a structure should exist, especially if you just take the um, take like a convex relaxation of the of the problem. Um, but on, on that point, um, so, so SQP here, sequential quadratic programming, is, I think it's kind of a, it's a nice, it's kind of a nice tool to use if you're in a continuous non-convex setting where you can form a sequence of convex quadratic approximations in that case. Um, in that case, you can differentiate either backwards through your sequence of convex approximations or through your last convex approximation if you think that it's at a fixed point. Um, so, I, um, lots of lots of things that you, lots of heuristics that you you can do. Um, so sometimes it's not clear which is which is best. Anyway, um, moving on to um, just kind kind of like step up one level um, and talk about some of the applications. So, throughout the rest of this talk, I will highlight a few applications. Um, um, but I wanted to just put them all on on one slide now, just to briefly mention all of them. So like I mentioned before, we can use these optimization layers to learn hard constraints, um, such as the example we had in the OptNet paper of learning Sudoku from data. Um, next, I, I think it's interesting to think about how we can use these layers to model projections onto interesting polytopes that don't necessarily have closed form solutions. So the ReLU sigmoid and softmax, they are all projecting onto polytopes, but they have explicit closed form solutions. Um, there are some other interesting operations that, that don't. So the top K operation can be seen as projecting onto a polytope. I'll talk about this example later. Sorting can also be seen as, as projecting onto a, a, a polytope and can be made soft. Um, in game theory, you can think about equilibrium finding as, as an optimization problem that you can differentiate through. Um, in Erlang control, which is something that I've, I've been focusing on a lot lately in my own work, is you can have differentiable control-based policies that are themselves solving optimization problems, doing reasoning about what's going to happen in the future. In meta-learning, you can use a differential SVM to help construct better embeddings. And I'll quickly talk about this example in more depth um, in a few slides. Um, and in the energy-based learning and structured prediction setting, you can think about differentiable inference that go through the um, optimization problem. Um, which I've mostly considered in the continuous convex setting, but I, I could believe that there are some interesting applications of this in more uh, complex settings too. Um, so going deep into just a few of these applications, um, I think the uh, one interesting one is that you can take the softmax um, optimization formulation and you can generalize it to um, what I'm calling uh, differentiable top K or um, into the setting where you have a polytope that has um, kind of K active elements at the vertices rather than just the single active element. 
Um, and that's, uh, that's essentially the only thing you need to do. If, you, if you're able to start with the softmax viewpoint of just projecting onto the simplex, you can construct this other polytope that has K active like labels or, or whatever you want to call them. And you can use this as a differentiable top K operation. And um, to, to get a, a little bit of intuition about, about what this polytope actually looks like, um, we can you know, think about some low dimensional visualizations of, of it. So um, if we start with K equals one, then we recover the simplex. And you can, in, in three dimensions, you can think about this top K projection with K equals one to just, I mean, it is just the simplex. Um, when K equals two, when you're in three dimensions, turns out that this is also just the, the simplex that's kind of moved around to the other vertices of your, of your box, uh, where it's the convex hole around the vertices that have um, two active elements. And so then if you want, in this case, if you want to find, say, the top, top two elements out of three, you know that the indexes of, of the set are going to lie on one of the vertices of this polytope. There are no other combinations of two elements that you can choose from from this polytope or from from this from the space of three three items. Um, and the the idea to making this projection soft is that you just need to put some kind of penalty surface on top of this polytope that um, kind of gives you some nicer properties that are related to the properties that the entropy penalty on top of the sigmoid and softmax and, and these other layers give you. And so we were looking at this with the bidirectional entropy, which gives you a surface that kind of looks like what I have at the bottom left. You can also, you can do some other things. Like if you, if you chop kind of like the edges of the softmax off, you can, you can get something that um, called the, the constrained softmax. Um, and you, there, are potentially, there are potentially other kinds of penalties you can put on onto this projection. Um, and another interesting extension, so this, this visualization I'm showing, it's in um, three dimensions with two active elements. And just to uh, kind of get an intuition, my, my intuition on higher dimensional reasoning is quite bad. Um, so if you have a four dimensional, um, say vector or space, and you want to construct the top two polytope for this space, um, what, does, does um, anybody have any intuition on, on what this polytope would look like? So you're in four dimensions and you want to take the top two components. It, it, so it kind of has like a, um, a lattice structure. It's, it's a, it looks like an octahedron where it's every combination of two um, active elements out of, out of like the four possible ones where you, you can move from one to another by just changing uh, one of the active labels at a time. And the idea is that you can also provide, uh, or you can also induce some, like the same entropy surface over these higher dimensional top K polytopes. And you can use all of this to make the top K operation differentiable. Um, so I will go back to using the differentiable top K operation later in this talk, but for now I'm going to move on to another application of, of di differential optimization more generally. And this is on um, sorting and SVMs now. So there's a pretty cool iClear paper a few years ago on showing that you can project onto the, uh, the Birkhoff polytope or the set of doubly stochastic matrices um, with an objective that looks like this um, to, uh, to essentially sort. And you can soften it in the same way that we've softened all of these other layers by also adding an entropy penalty on top of this projection. And this has some interesting applications where you, you, you know that you might want to construct some latent representations of your, of your objects, and then you might want to sort them or do, solve some kind of matching problem on top of, the, um, on top of your latent representations of your objects. Um, so here's a nice way of doing this with this is, uh, differentiable optimization modeling. In this case, they actually are able to differentiate through this problem in a slightly nicer way than having to go through the optimality conditions, but in theory, you, you could also implicitly differentiate the KQT system or the optimal optimality conditions of, of this problem. 
Um, second, um, SVMs. You can see SVMs as mapping your data set to uh, the optimal hyperplane. And in general, it's really intractable to, if you have a, a, like a huge data set, it would be intractable to differentiate the uh, optimal hyperplane you get out with respect to like the entire data set. Although you, you, you could, and it might, it might tell you how sensitive the op optimal hyperplane is um, to specific entries in your training data set um, as, a, as a way of doing kind of sensitivity analysis of, of, of that, which I think is kind of a nice property when you have a convex um, learning procedure, um, which becomes much harder when you, when you have an, a neural network and you're trying to determine the sensitivity of, 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 of the inputs. Um, so what Meta OptNet does is that they, they say um, they're in the meta learning context where all of their data sets are small. And so it's actually even, even more tractable to differentiate the optimal hyperplane that you get out of an SVM when it's applied to your, um, uh, your meta training set or to your, one of the inner training sets that just consists of a few examples. Where the advantage of differentiating through the SVM in this context is that it tells you how you can best update the embeddings of your small training data set such that when you perform uh, SVM classification on top of it, you achieve optimal performance on, on the um, meta learning task that you care about. Um, and you're, since you're able to form the SVM optimization problem as a convex optimization problem, you can just do fixed point differentiation on the convex optimization um, uh, problem to differentiate through the SVM in this context. Um, so that's kind of all that I have on the more kind of theoretical side or, or the more applications side. And if there aren't any questions or, or comments on, on these, then I'll move on to talking about some, um, uh, something on, on like the kind of like the more practical and implementation side. Right, so, um, so I, I have been hiding a lot in, in the presentation of, of these ideas because it's actually very non-trivial to construct the implicit differentiation that's needed to go through the optimality conditions of either quadratic programs or conic programs. And it involves a lot of kind of like setting up messy linear systems and thinking about what these, like what, like, what you actually need to compute for the, to get the right to implicit derivatives. Um, and then on the coding side, it actually involves, like some, it requires a lot of care because you need to solve rather large dimensional linear systems for an entire batch of examples at the same time. And you might end up getting code that looks kind of like this where you're, um, Kind of like manually tracking and, and like moving around some uh, sub factorizations of like your KKT matrix to to make sure that you're efficiently efficiently exploiting like the block the block sparsity pattern in your KKT system. So this is kind of a lot of a lot of details, and I claim that practitioners shouldn't really care as much about about these details. And I think that there is quite a nice way of abstracting this away so that practitioners can think about just the the modeling aspect first as a way of prototyping these ideas so that, that you don't have to write out all of this implicit di differentiation stuff every time you want to try a new idea out of, um, uh, for differentiable optimization. And the way of doing this is to use CVXPy as a way of constructing differentiable optimization layers in PyTorch and TensorFlow. And if you're not familiar with CVXPy, it's a rather nice convex optimization modeling tool that allows you to express convex optimization problems in a few lines of code um, so that you can construct all of the kind of like examples that I had before in a few lines of code. And our, our project here will enable you to export them to a PyTorch or TensorFlow layer that can be efficiently uh, solved with like in the modeling part of your pipeline that is able to properly handle the, like batching operations and solving the optimization problems and doing the fixed point differentiation. Um, so this um, kind of like, a, I'll, I'll kind of go 
a bit quickly through this section so I can get to some of the stuff I have later in this talk. But the idea is that you transform the convex problem down into a conic, pro conic program. You differentiate that conic program and then return the solution back. And then the, the only detail that you need to work out is how do you map from CVX pi down to the conic program? How do you differentiate the conic program? And then how do you kind of like map that back, back up to the original CVX pi space? Um, but we've taken care of all of this. And so from the user's perspective, you can just essentially write a few lines of codes to get the functionality of, of convex optimization layers in your, in your code. Um, so I, I have a few code examples. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so I have a quick question. So you mentioned before that you know, a QP has a, a, a more efficient uh, way of writing down the optimality conditions in a general conic program. Uh, I imagine in CVX Pi, it's using a general form. So can you can you comment about the efficiency of the compilation process for general case versus special cases? Are you, um, yes. Are you talking about the um, differentiation part or the the the, the differentiate the differentiation part? I, I imagine that if you write things down differently, it'll lead to different, um, more or less efficient ways of representing the optimality conditions. And you also mentioned that for softmax, there may not even, or for some of these, there may not even be a unique. Um, that's one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I'll I'll start with it. So yeah, there there are like two points two points there. Um, the first one is how does how does he like doing the right how does the right block structure knowledge of the KKT system transfer over into the conic optimality conditions. And actually, the, the, something that's rather elegant about the conic optimality conditions is that they capture the KKT optimality conditions as a special case when you have simple cones. Um, and so in theory, I think some of the same optimizations can be done um, that, that we were using in the quadratic programs. Um, but we're, we're not actually, because for the differentiating through the conic programs, we're actually taking advantage of the sparsity patterns in the optimality conditions um, kind of like as a whole, um, which isn't necessarily taking as advantage or as, as much, we're not actually gaining the, as much from like the block sparsity structure. So there are like rather large dense blocks that are present in these, um, some of these optimality conditions that we're not taking advantage of with this more general sparse, sparse suit. But it turns out just, um, Seeing a, like using a lot of sparse operations and just using multi-threading to solve batches of the backwards pass seems to go a long way. Um, so the performance is about on par with, with what we had before. Um, oh, second point you mentioned is is the uniqueness, and I don't I don't I don't know how to to deal with this. So so for the the uniqueness, the the problem is that like for example, if you have an LP and you are um, you're, you're some, somehow your polytope has an edge that's at like kind of aligned with the cost surface so that any possible solution to your LP lies on that entire edge of, of the polytope. In this case, I, I think it's, it's rather ill-defined what a derivative actually means because you're not even getting a unique solution out of, out of that optimization problem. And so what we're doing in the code currently to handle this is that we are, um, Kind of taking taking like the least squares solution to this um to the, like this last implicit differentiation um, step and in practice it it seems to it seems to work for for some problems but I, I think the theory there is is really not well understood on on what that's actually giving um yeah so. So now we can take this thing that I, I wrote like a thousand lines of code for before, uh, the quadratic program, and you can now implement it in 10 lines, which, which I have in the slides. If you want to review that later, I'll, I'll kind of skip over the details um, over these next few slides. Um, you can do it for the sigmoid too. So you can write out the optimization viewpoints of the sigmoid in a few lines of code and you can get out the, the, the solution that you would expect. Um, I have the code examples for these constraint models where you can, um, have layers that project onto polytopes and learn the parameters of those polytopes. Um, and let's see, I, I guess 
I, I, there are a few minutes left. What time does this class in? Um, so uh, the class actually officially runs until uh, 1030 um, Pacific time. Um, uh, depending on um, how long you want to go, you can go all the way up to then at that, that point if you want. Of course, you can end early if you want. Ah, I see. Um, I'll, I'll just take about 10 more, 10 more minutes. I, I only plan for, for about an hour or so of, of Sounds good. material. So. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, these next, I, I do have quite a few more slides, but I'll, I'll go quickly through them and, and just, you, I'll leave them on the course website so that, that you, you all can go through them. Um, this, so this last part is, is a more applications side of, um, of, of, of this work in the uh, controls and reinforcement learning area where you can differentiate through controllers. And kind of one of the big questions in the community right now is, should your RL policies have a system dynamics model or not? Where in a lot of cases, um, a lot of the reinforcement learning work has shown that you are able to say, take the current state of, of some continuous system that you're trying to control. And if you apply a neural network to that state in the right way, like a, a neural black box neural network policy to that state in the right way, you can get out the optimal action to solve this infinite horizon MDP that involves a lot of reasoning. And I think this has been a surprising result in the community that you can go so far without having any explicit knowledge about how, you're, how the dynamical system that you're trying to model, um, how that evolves over time and without having any explicit reasoning capacity. And I, I guess this makes sense if you're able to formulate the solution to say an infinite horizon MDP in kind of like this way that gives you out like model free uh, policies or model free value estimates. And I can kind of believe that in the um, infinite horizon case where if you have enough data and if you, if you have enough samples and you have a sufficiently low dimensional system you, you could probably get pretty far with just throwing, throwing large neural networks at, at your states to um, optimally control the MDP. Um, however, I think there are some cases where it is useful to think about um, what, what priors you have on the world. And if you are able to add them into the modeling part of your pipeline so that you can then have something that says, here's a state, Here's some reasoning I'm going to do with the state based on, say, some, some dynamics that I, I know or some kind of plan that I, I think I'm going to apply given the state. And then you can kind of reason about how, how you want to combine all of these components. For example, how do you use future plans? How do you generate future plans? How do you model the dynamics? How do you use that model of the dy dynamics? And you still have a neural network flying around that possibly could just override all of this stuff and, and could just say, I think this future plan is bad. I think these dynamics are bad. So I'm just going to predict the solution given only the state. And I, I, I think it's, it's not very well understood how you can, like the right way of combining a lot of these for general MDPs. Um, and I think uh, one of the really challenging parts is having a nice way of modeling the world and making sure that your assumptions are kind of like general enough for approaches that use explicit models can benefit from, from them. Um, so there's, um, I guess, on, on the other side of, of the space, kind of like more on the control side, where you know that you're operating within the, some, some system and you're able to explicitly reason about the future paths through that system. Um, and that maybe there's not even any learning that, that, that happens. So in the standard case with say industrial control systems, you know how your dynamics works, you know the cost that you want to optimize for, you, you know your states because you're able to extract all of this symbolically. And without any learning, you're able to solve essentially the same control problems or solve, solve MDPs just as RL is able to solve MDPs, except you just solve an optimization problem rather than running any, any learning. And and like now the, I think one of the cool directions that the fields are going is that you can kind of start thinking about policy classes that use control kind of explicitly inside of them. And kind of another direction is that 
what happens when you're controlling a system that you don't completely know, or maybe you, maybe you know parts of it that you can fill in, but you don't know like uh, some other parts, kind of like, like specific parameters or, or terms that kind of change depending on the environment. And so then you can kind of start fitting your cost or dynamics models with maximum likelihood or something to the observed trajectories that you've had from the system. And I guess one, before going into the, the differential optimization side of this, there's one big problem that I, I kind of want to highlight that comes up when you're thinking about problems in this way. And the problem is objective mismatch. And so it's, it's when you're operating, you have a policy or controller interacting with an environment that's giving you either re some set of rewards or state transitions. I claim if, if you just do maximum likelihood fitting to, of, of say your dynamics models, to either these state transitions or to your rewards, then you're going to get a model back that is optimal for the likelihood of the, uh, of the trajectories that you have observed. But this isn't the objective that you actually care about optimizing because you actually care about taking this dynamics model, putting in into an optimizer or putting it into a policy, and then using that policy to interact with the environment giving and give you some reward. And there are really nasty ways that this breaks down because you're never doing the end-to-end -end learning of, uh, of the reward that you're getting with respect to the dynamics. Um, you're only fitting the dynamics for the likelihood of, of your trajectories. Um, so um, I, I claim that, so there are a lot of ways of, of kind of trying to get around this issue. And I claim differential optimization is one potential strategy of, of avoiding this problem because you can then just see everything as end-to-end -end optimizable and you can use your reward signal and the, um, the policy that your dynamics induces as just other black box operations that you differentiate through with, with differential optimization. Um, so kind of moving, moving back into the details of differential optimization in this setting. So we can write out, say, um, a, a deterministic finite horizon continuous state action uh, control problem um, like this, where it says we're given some initial system state. And we want to find the optimal control sequence, uh, U, that gives us the best cost on the system. And everything's deterministic, so, so we are able to just um, take that state, roll out some sequence of actions, and get, and get some future sequence of states. So here I'm assuming you either have an approximate or known um, version of the cost and dynamics. And the idea is that this, this thing, this optimization problem, gives you some, some policy that kind of like the black box policies that re, like people, people are using neural networks for in, in the reinforcement learning world, where you are able to take the solution of this policy and you can differentiate it with respect to the parameters that you have, which in this case, the parameters are the um, cost surface and the dynamics of, of how you think the system is transitioning. And there are quite a few ways that you can differentiate through, through a controller like this. Um, one of them being um, the sequential uh, convex programming or the sequential quadratic programming. Um, but I won't talk about the details of, of that too much here. Um, but in general, it, uh, I am, or you can do differentiable control on top of non-convex control problems. Um, and kind of just to, uh, to put the picture on top of all of these ideas is that you can see control as just another layer that you can kind of compose with other things that you have in, in your system. And you can use this to augment other differential policies that you are using in, in say, model-free algorithms with policies that also have some control component. Um, in, in other settings, you can potentially replace unrolled controllers with something that is solving an explicit optimization problem. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can fight objective mismatch by end-to-end -end learning your dynamics also through the, um, the controller rather than just for the likelihood. And you can also potentially start thinking about how you can learn um, the, cost fun like the, the, the cost function that you want to use. Um, and this is nice in settings where you might not even necessarily know the, the true state that you're optimizing over. Maybe you're optimizing over some latent space where it's not very well defined on like, what cost you actually want to optimize for. 
and uh, maybe you don't even know the, the true costs that you want to put into the controller that gives you the performance that you actually want in the system. And you can do learning to recover that too. Quick question. Uh, when you yeah. say uh, solving this using sequential convex programming, um, does that mean that you have, it's, it's almost like a recurrent neural net in this case where you've unrolled this templated problem over time and you backprop through a sequence of optimality conditions? Um, yeah, you can do that. Um, <clears throat> We, we, we actually, in, this, in the settings we were looking at, we were able to hit a fixed point with the sequence of quadratic programs. And because we were able to hit a fixed point, we only differentiated through that fixed point. But if we weren't able to consistently hit a fixed point, what you're suggesting would, would work, or it would, be, it would be something to do, or it, I think it would be better than trying to differentiate through this fixed point. And it would give you this kind of, like, yeah, I guess the thing that looks kind of like a recurrent neural network that's solving a sequence of, of convex problems that you're differentiating through. Um, yes, I, um, I, I have another slide on kind of on this in, in a few slides that, that we, can, we can come back to as well. Um, bef before then, just a quick experimental kind of like results here of optimizing for the task loss versus optimizing for the sysid loss or for the maximum likelihood loss of, of your dynamics. And, and this illustration is, is kind of showing the concept I mentioned earlier of if you're trying to approximate the dynamics of, of the system that you're acting in, it's not, it's, it's, you, you can take the, the maximum likelihood solution of, of that, or the best mean squared error here in, in, in this case, if you have deterministic dynamics. Um, but that might not necessarily give you the best loss on some other task that you care about. So here I'm, I'm comparing it to the imitation loss. And if you are able to start including that, that knowledge, you, you can improve the overall performance of your system um, by using the derivatives of the controller with respect to the dynamics um, to optimize for the imitation loss. Um, and maybe it will result in a slightly worse um, maximum likelihood or, or likelihood solution or uh, mean squared error um, than you would get by directly optimizing for the mean squared error. Um, but you get a significant gain in the task that you actually care about. And I, um, one of the last kind of things that I want to talk about today is related to this idea of unrolling optimizers, either by unrolling through, it, so you can unroll through um, a sequence of quadratic programs like you song mentioned. And I claim that there are other interesting unrolled optimizers that we can think about and we can use um, that are especially useful in the control setting. And one of them is the cross entropy method, which is it's an iterative sampling based optimizer that doesn't actually use the derivative information of your of the of the objective that it's optimizing over and it's a it's kind of it's a well studied method that works by um, maintaining distributions over the domain and refining those distributions and this visualization i have is showing what a simple function where you start with a like a large gaussian around the function and you're able to uh, slowly refine that around the optimal um, part of this function. And so then um, once you have this optimal part of the function, you, you can just kind of look at like the mean or, or um, you can look at like the, where the distribution is sampling to get the optimal part of the function. And the cross entropy method and other zero order optimizers have some nice properties that they are able to nicely go around local optimum that gradient-based optimizers might get stuck in. Um, so for example, in this cost service that I showed, if there were a few nasty local optimum, um, because the cross entry method is able, is maintaining this, um, uh, a set of samples from the objective at each iteration, it's able to more nicely just smooth over them. Um, where also in this example, as, as the colors get darker, it's, it's showing the um, further iterations of, of the algorithm. And 
This method is actually state of the art for a lot of controls and model-based RL tasks because um, controls and model-based RL is a space that's rife with a lot of really weird local optimum that kind of come from like slight perturbations in, in the problem where if you're using a, like the cross interview method, you're able to more nicely smooth over, over those um, bad transitions or bad, bad uh, parts of the cost surface. And so one idea, uh, because this is a state of the art optimizer for control and, and RL is to uh, differentiate backwards through it. And you can do this by uh, using, you can, so it, it turns out that to do this, is, it's, it's quite easy to differentiate through the sequence of, of samples by differentiating through the top K operation, which I mentioned earlier, and using the reparameterization trick on the distributions that you're sampling from. And this is kind of analogous to unrolling through either a sequence of quadratic programs or through a sequence of, of gradient steps, um, except now it's just through a sequence of samples on your objective. And this is useful in all of the same settings where unrolling other optimizers is useful because uh, like when you can't hit a fixed point, because um, you can you can then unroll this like this you, you cannot you, it gives you some heuristic definition of of what a gradient would be in this in this setting of the optimal solution of your optimizer with respect to some some parameters that you have of the cost surface that you are optimizing. Um, although this is an extremely ill defined concept of, of what you actually want to do in the, the non-convex setting. Um, but it, it works in, it works sometimes. Um, and in the RL setting, you, it gives you a differentiable controller that is using the, um, that is going through the cross interview method. Um, some, uh, one interesting idea in, in this space is that you can use differential optimizers to construct latent manifolds or latent spaces of your optimal solutions. So if you know you want to solve a lot of optimization problems at, at the same time, or, or if you know you have some structure to your optimization problems or to the solution space of your optimization problems, you can use differential optimizers to learn that structure. Where maybe you're up, you know that the original do, or the full domain of your optimization problem is a, is a box. Um, but maybe every time you solve that optimization problems, you, you don't get like a uniform distribution over the entire box. You get a distribution that probably lies within sub, some subspace of that box, um, which here I'm calling like a manifold of optimal solutions. And I claim that it's interesting to think about how you can, how you can learn a nice representation of this manifold of optimal solutions for optimization problems that you, you care about solving repeatedly. And this happens a lot in the control setting because in the control setting, you have this control optimization problem that is exactly the same, except every time you're solving it, you're just solving it with a different initial system state. Um, but everything else stays the same. And so one could believe that there's a lot of structure over the optimal solutions to say the hard pole problem given different initial system states um, because it's still controlling the same dynamical system. And if you plot out the iterates of what, say, the cross entropy method looks like on the Cartpole system, you would get something that looks kind of like this um, at the top, where you start with a uniform distribution over the box, and you slowly refine that in the Euclidean space over the box. And I claim that if you know that you're going to be solving optimization problems that have like kind of the same structure at the end, then you could you 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 could just learn that space of, of like optimal solutions and then only search over that space. Um, and so this is what happens when you use DSIM to learn the space at, at the bottom. As you can see um, in iteration zero, it's only starting to sample reasonable solutions to say that the cart pull problem, which exhibit this kind of periodic behavior where it's, it's like, uh, it's just learning to kind of swing up the, the pole with this, this periodic motion. And so there's no solution to the cart pull that would involve say, repeatedly like thrashing the control bounds of the problem in, in every time step, like all of the original simulations look like. And 
as DSIM refines the solution over this latent space, um, it's, you, you can kind of see that the perturbations that it's making in this latent space are much more reasonable than the perturbations that SIM is making over the, the original Euclidean box space. Um, and this is again because perturbations on this manifold are much nicer than, or they capture the structure of your problem much nicer than perturbations in the um, original Euclidean space. Um, and at the very bottom, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm showing actually that you can learn a, just a two dimensional representation. I'm not, I'm not doing TSNI or, or PCA or anything to, to generate these services. I'm actually learning a two dimensional latent representation that we optimize over with DSIM um, to learn the, um, uh, to, to learn the uh, samples that I'm showing above it. Um, so each point in this latent space corresponds to one uh, sequence through the uh, control space above it. Um, and kind of lastly, just it's kind of kind of just to show us like one of one more application of, of all of this is uh, this is the cheetah system, where at, at each point in time of this system, an optimization problem is being solved with DSIM or, or with the cross entropy method over this this DSIM latent space to optimally control the cheetah. And it's doing this by reasoning about the future rollouts of, of the, the system of, of the model. It's able to predict the rewards and it kind of knows how the actions are, are going to impact all of this so that it can predict the optimal sequence of, of, of actions. And here we were able to use DSIM to tune the dynamics approximation. So the, the, the blue lines here were showing the approximated dynamics of, of the GDIS system. We were able to tune those so that they induced a better performance on the overall system, rather than just inducing a good likelihood um, when fitting the dynamics to the, um, the observed trajectories. Um, so popping back up a bit, um, this has been kind of a, a whirlwind tour through quite a few of the, um, what I find interesting ideas in the optimization-based modeling space. And I think optimization is, is a powerful primitive that we can use in our larger systems and the theoretical and engineering foundations for these models are here. And we can propagate through and learn optimization layers just as we learn every other layer. And in fact, these captures every other, like a lot of, not every other, but a lot of the other layers like the ReLU sigmoid and softmax as, as kind of like special instances. So in some ways we all are already using different optimization layers. And they provide a nice perspective, I think, to analyze and look at, look at operations and you can project on, onto sets, even if a closed form solution doesn't exist. And it seems like there are quite, quite a few applications in, in model-based RL, control, meta-learning, and energy-based learning um, among, among some of the others. And um, yeah, that's, that's it for my, my talk. Um, I've, I've put a few references at, um, at the end of my presentation if you want to go into any of these um, in more depth. Thanks. Great, thank you, Brandon. Are there any questions from the audience? I have a question. Uh, hey, uh, so, so you referred to CEM as being more, um, kind of like less susceptible to these um, local uh, optima. So is that a result of the optimization procedure? Or is that more a result of like, having a, a distribution over possible candidate actions? Oh, um, yeah, I guess, I guess both. Um, that having this distribution enables you to have at each iteration to have like this larger view of the objective that you're optimizing over rather than just having like a single point and, and updating that with just the local gradient information. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other question I had was, so you're kind of referring more to like, you know, we should be learning models that are good for planning, not good at just modeling the environment. Um, so I, I know like, I think that's a s similar kind of motivation behind like the predict uh, Predictron and other types of models like that. Um, have you seen more of a push toward that direction in the literature lately? Or is it kind of still pretty sparse? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the Pedictron is a, a good example of, of this, which I think in their setting, they were looking at 
discrete action MDPs. Um, yeah, I think this idea of differentiating through planning is coming up more and more. So the, um, I, I would even interpret things like mu zero, one of, one of DeepMind's recent mm -hmm. works as having a nice latent kind of like search operation for discrete MDPs. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? So um, I had a couple of questions. Maybe the first one for the for the students in the class who are you know learning about these topics for the first time. Many of them are thinking about um, you know what to do as a, a research project for the class. What are some sort of ideas that you think are interesting that are great class projects, maybe ideas that, you know, you uh, uh, don't have time to do and, you know, things that you wanted to tinker with, you know, do, do you have a list of such ideas that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I think There are a lot of like um, unexplored optimization problems that haven't haven't been made differentiable, but but could be. Um, I think the space is closing off rather rather fast, or at least the space that I can see of, of this is closing off rather fast. As it, it seems like a lot of people are thinking about differentiable optimization in, in almost every context that optimization is being used in. Um, but I, I think that there's still unexplored parts, just, just in like the simple base case of convex problems where we know how to differentiate through them. So it, I think it depends on the kind of like the, like the application or, or domain where, where, where the work is coming from, but maybe, maybe in optimal transport or, or game theory, um, especially there, there are some other interesting optimization problems there that can be kind of taken in and looked at through the lens of, of machine learning um, to provide some, some interesting uh, new learning in, in those domains. Um, beyond that, I, I think the extensions beyond like this base case I, are, are very interesting. That beyond the base case of just continuous convex cons constrained problems where yeah, maybe you have a discrete optimization problem and, and you want to do something similar, or maybe you 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 have some 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 non non-convex problem that kind of makes sense. So you want to think about other other optimization algorithms that could be made differentiable um, to kind of like solve this others, like in the space of differentiable unrolled non-convex optimi optimization. Um, so yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, those are kind of my two quick thoughts on, on this. Great. Um, thank you so much, Brandon, for taking the time to uh, give this lecture for the class. Uh, it's really great to hear from one of the experts who had you know, spent so many years working on these uh, topics. And we'll be putting the uh, slides and the lecture video online for everyone. So thank you so much again, Brandon. Sounds great, thanks. Thank you.